Okay. Last week I introduced our study of the book of Proverbs, and I pointed out that Proverbs, the book, is divine instruction for skillful living in God's world. That's how I like to put it. I think that captures the essence of it. This instruction for skillful living, how to live a life and principles for how to live in a way that will lead to blessing and will lead to a good life. And I said a bit about the title and the nature, the authorship, the date, and the structure of the book. And regarding the classical Proverbs, the, what we typically think of as Proverbs that begin in chapter 10, I noted that they almost always are statements of general principles rather than absolute truths, and that they apply only in certain circumstances rather than universally. And I think those things are important to understand as we look at Proverbs, because if you look at them as law documents, you're going to scratch your head sometimes. But you have to understand that they are Proverbs. Now, when the bell rang, I'd just given you my understanding of this figure in Proverbs, woman wisdom. Now, this morning, what I want to do, I'm going to finish the introduction by commenting briefly on the relevance of Proverbs for the church and by acknowledging that wisdom is both an achievement and a divine goal. And then after that, we'll move on to the text and just see how far we get. Now, as part of Holy Scripture, the book of Proverbs is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training the man of God and, uh, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, training in righteousness. Paul says that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Proverbs is Holy Scripture, so we know that that's true of Proverbs. It's useful for that. Now, the New Testament writers, they repeatedly apply Proverbs to Christians, to the church. I say that because sometimes you say, well, Old Testament, we got nothing to do with the Old Testament. I'm over here going, what? <laughs> See, what? But they repeatedly apply the Proverbs to the church. There are some 60 direct quotations, definite allusions, and parallels of Proverbs in the New Testament. And they're often used to teach Christians, to teach the church how to live godly lives. Now, though the immediate addressees, talking about how do we apply this in the church, the immediate addressees of various Proverbs are young men. We'll see that. See, the addressees, the immediate addressees of the Proverbs, various Proverbs are young men. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 2 to 7, however, it serves as a, it serves as a kind of preamble to the entire collection. It identifies the ultimate audience of Proverbs as the simple, the young, and the wise without specifying their sex. Okay, so the immediate audience of a number of the Proverbs, various Proverbs, is young men. But we see here that in the preamble, you have the audience defined as the simple, the young, and the wise without specifying their sex. And since Proverbs in its final form is part of Scripture, it's part of the canon, its audience includes all of God's people, men and women. Okay, so it's often necessary, it's appropriate and necessary for women to apply Proverbs to themselves. Women don't say, well, this was addressed to a man, therefore Proverbs is irrelevant to me. That's not how to go about uh, understanding it. You see, it's appropriate and necessary for women to apply Proverbs to themselves, which may require changing the sex of a person in Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 21.9, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now, I think that advice applied to a woman becomes it's better to live in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome husband. You see, I think that's how it would, it would be applied. It's similar to the process that one goes through in trying to hear correctly other writings of Scripture that were directed to specific audiences in the past. You see, there's a process that you go through. In studying 1 Corinthians, for example, you first seek to understand what God intended to communicate through Paul to the Corinthians 
And when you see that and you understand that correctly, you're then in a position to understand what he's saying to you today through what he initially said to the Corinthians. So by hearing what God through Solomon was saying to men in Proverbs 21.9, one is then in a position to hear what God is saying to women through that text. So this is the idea, how does this apply to the church? And I want the women to see that it's not time to snooze because this says to men that there is an application that you take from the initial specific audience and then you generalize it because it's part of the canon and it speaks to all of God's people. So that's, I think, is an important thing. Now, Longman rightly notes that, that wisdom is both something one is to strive for it's something one is to strive for through hard study. You see, we'll see this repeatedly, that wisdom is something that we are to pursue through hard study. It's not something we just fall back on. We can't be lazy about it. We have to be diligent. We have to want it. We have to seek it. So he makes that point, but it's also a gift from God. And you see that in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. It's both. It's something, it's an achievement, something that we gain through diligent study, but it's also something that God gives us. As Longman says, somehow these two truths do not undermine each other. Well, God gives it as a gift to those who pursue it diligently. Those are the ones he gifts are those who pursue it. So we have a role to play in the pursuit of wisdom. I want you to see that. All of this is, is before we embark on the study. We have a role to play in the pursuit of wisdom. We have to apply ourselves to the task. We cannot be theologically lazy. It's just like a hungry person can't be content merely to be within the vicinity of food. We have to reach out and partake of it. See, we can't just sit here next to Proverbs. We have to engage it. We have to reach out and bring it in and internalize it. And I'm going to try to help us do that as we work through the book. Now, the extended discourses on wisdom, the first nine chapters, I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time on that. And then chapters 10 to 31, I'm just going to talk about some selected Proverbs. I will give you a breakdown, a categorization of many of the Proverbs. And we'll talk about some of those. And then I'll comment on some of the Proverbs. But I won't go through every one of the Proverbs. But on the first nine chapters, I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time. So we begin here in, in Proverbs. You have this, the superscription and, and the preamble in chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Now, this is poetry. I've kind of blocked it all together. Usually, you'll have it set out as poetry where the verses are uh, new paragraphs. But you're going to have to live with this because I can fit more on a slide. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction... To understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction as i said in the introduction the book of proverbs where it says the proverbs of solomon and linda and i were talking about this last week now when you hear that depending on what you've been taught you hear that as saying that means they were written by solomon and of solomon is a looser connection than that clearly from the text itself solomon did not write all of the proverbs in the collection we have the wise we have agur we have Lemuel, identified as authors and origins of the Proverbs. So it doesn't mean that he's the source or author of all. It's a looser connection than that. It's, it's these Proverbs, well, what is that connection? The Proverbs are of Solomon, that he is the dominant contributor to the collection. And he was Israel's greatest wisdom teacher. I mean, he is like the wisdom teacher. So they're of Solomon, and he's the dominant contributor, and he's the greatest wisdom teacher. So what it is, essentially, it is a collection of Proverbs of the great Solomon that have been introduced 
through the first nine chapters, you have this introduction that prepares you to embark on this journey and really benefit from the Proverbs. It's been introduced and it's been supplemented by others in conformity with the wisdom of Solomon. So even the supplementation is fruit of Solomon's root. So it's of Solomon in that more general sense. Okay, so it's, it's the, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then in verses 2 to 6, you get the purpose of the collection. And the purpose is to impart to all readers. To impart to all the readers wisdom and instruction. To provide understanding of insightful sayings and instruction and wise dealing which involves acting in righteousness, justice, and equity. So it's a pretty a noble goal, what is being set here for the book of Proverbs. The simple, he refers to the simple. He says here, to give prudence to the simple. The simple or simple-minded, they are inexperienced, naive. That's what's meant by the simple. They're paralleled in verse 4 with the young or with youth. See, unlike the fool or the mocker, they're teachable. They're just naive. They're inexperienced. Not like the fool or the mocker. Proverbs seeks to provide the simple prudence. Seeks to provide the simple, the ability to gauge circumstances calmly and to navigate the problems of life. Isn't that worth pursuing? Right? I mean, to, to gauge these things calmly and to navigate life, the problems of life, the book seeks to give the young knowledge and discretion, the latter being the ability to make right judgment so as to avoid pitfalls in life. Don't you want your children to, to learn this? Why? Because you want blessing for their lives. That's what you as parents are trying to do. You are trying to give them wisdom. Why? So that they will live a blessed life. And so here we have this concentrated divine wisdom here in the book of Proverbs. The wise and discerning. They're encouraged in verses 5 and 6 to absorb what's offered in Proverbs. That they may enhance their wisdom and gain further guidance for life. The book he says, can make them more adept at comprehending various kinds of wisdom sayings whose meaning is not readily apparent. You see, the riddles. You see, there are some wisdom sayings that require some turning around and some unlocking to really see what's being said and to benefit from them. Well, he says here that it can make them more adept at comprehending these various kinds of sayings whose meaning is not readily apparent and thereby be better equipped to gain from those sayings. So you have here for the simple, for the youth, and for the wise. The wise too can benefit from studying Proverbs. Now the preamble, it climaxes with this declaration that the fear of Yahweh, the fear of the Lord, you see all, all capitalized. The fear of Yahweh, the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's foundational to knowledge, which is used here as a near synonym to wisdom. You see, when he says it's foundational to knowledge, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge is there used as a near synonym for wisdom. And you can see that from the contrast. On the other hand, fools despise wisdom. You see, so from the contrast, you see that knowledge is being used as something of a synonym for wisdom, and you can see that clearly in Proverbs 9, 10, when the word wisdom is used for the very same statement, where he says there, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, so that's what this is about. The book is about giving wisdom to people, this skill for living in God's world, and it will benefit the simple, it will benefit the young, it will benefit the wise. And we are to engage it and apply ourselves to it. Now to fear Yahweh means to be in submission to Him. It means to be committed to living in accordance with His will. And, and thus to value the way of life that He intends for His creatures. That attitude drives one, see, not only to learn God's will. 
It drives one not only to do that, but to adopt God's will. To adopt that will, to walk in God's path, to live life as a godly man or a godly woman. So all of this is wrapped up in the fear of Yahweh. In addition, acceptance of God's sovereignty, that's foundational for true wisdom because it put, puts life and all of its experiences in their proper context. How do you think you can function and live skillfully and properly when your entire approach to life is based on a lie that you came from nowhere out of nothing by chance? You, you're out of the correct context of everything. So no wonder you're not going to be able to live skillfully. See, we're creatures made in God's image and we are intended to reflect His glory and our lives are part of a history that is unfolding under God's direction. And it is important for living in this world that we have that lens and that perspective on reality. So it's broader than simply being motivated and committed to taking God's will and applying. It affects all of our perspective. And so this idea of the fear of Yahweh being foundational is important. Now that attitude is in contrast, you see, to the fool who because he has no fear of God, he despises wisdom and instruction. Meaning the fool places no value on God's map for life. That doesn't matter to the fool. The fool says in his heart there is no God. So he doesn't care. What, you know, he doesn't believe that there is a map, a way of skillfully living. He doesn't believe that this is God's world. And so he's completely deaf and blind to this blessing of wisdom that is being offered so that you may live a blessed life. He sits here and just completely blows all of that off. This prideful rebellion, this refusal to accept reality, closes the fool's eyes to God's light for living. That's what he's giving us. How are we to conduct ourselves? Chapter 1, verse 8 to 19, he says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. For their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood for in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird but these men lie in wait for their own blood they set an ambush for their own lives such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain it takes away the life of its possessors now this first discourse we hear in in chapters one through nine this discourse or this instruction of a father to the son, it's an exhortation to avoid evil associations, not to get drawn into the evil intentions of others. Is that good advice? You bet you. See, not to get drawn into the evil intentions of others. It begins with a call for the son to heed the teaching of his parents. Not simply to be aware of that teaching. See, when teaching is applied, when it is heeded, not simply heard and blown off, when it's heeded, you see, that teaching adorn one's life, one's life like a wreath. He says it adorns one's life like a wreath and a neck ornament. As a neck ornament adorns one, one's body. When that teaching is internalized and applied, it's something attractive and desirable, like this garland and this pendant. Attractive and desirable when it is heated. There's a reward to be gained in this endeavor. 
You see, there's a reward to be gained in our diligent pursuit of this. Now, the parents in Proverbs, they are, of course, assumed to be wise parents. You see, and they're thus assumed to reflect divine wisdom in the teaching of their child. It's not like these are pagan people who are teaching. So when he speaks in, of parents, you're to heed them. He's, of course, assuming that you have wise parents who accept and fear Yahweh. And so that's something that's uh, just part of the understood background of it. Now, the son is warned not to allow himself to be lured into evil by other people. See, when people who are eager for wrongdoing, when they try to entice you to join them by appealing to the alleged benefits of their sin, you see what they're saying here? Come on, man. You throw in with us, we'll have one purse, we go take these people out, we'll rob them, and we'll have a lot of stuff. Just be one purse, we'll all share in it equally. You see, when, they're tr when somebody's trying to entice you by appealing to these alleged benefits, the wise course is to resist. He says, do not step onto that path. Have you had people in your life? I'm thinking of a friend we had when we were kids growing up. This guy, every time you're around this guy, he's trying to get you into trouble, man. I'm telling you, from shoplifting to whatever he's doing, he had his throat slit when he was 22 years old and died, as my dad always prophesied. Although my dad missed it by a year. He said he would be dead by the time he was 21. And he was killed by a woman he was with when he was 22. But, I, you know, I know people like that. You've known people like that. Don't you want your children to avoid people like that? And God wants us to avoid people like that. Whereas even birds will, won't walk into an obvious trap. That's this thing down here. For in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird. You know, these birds aren't stupid. <laughs> you know, despite what we think. I mean, a bird watch you set this trap. That bird's going to say, oh, you really? <laughs> you think I'm going to fly into that? You see, so he says even birds won't walk into an obvious trap, but evildoers are trapping themselves by the things of which they're fully aware. A bird won't walk into an obvious trap, but these people are trapping themselves by the very things they do. They're trapping themselves. I mean, how crazy is that? By their lives, they're plotting disaster for themselves and they don't have enough sense to realize it. They are plotting disaster for themselves, and they're clueless about it. Greed for unjust gain. Coveting what rightfully belongs to another person leads to a destroyed life. Literally and figuratively. Trying to get rich quick by theft and even murder is no way to navigate life. Now you think of all the disasters and heartaches and all the things that have happened in people's lives because somebody wanted something somebody else had. Just think about it. People coming in, robbing everywhere, shooting people. Why? I want something you got. I want your money. You know, it, it, just think of it. Magnify this out through the society. And here is this voice saying, that's no way to live. You see, that's not the right way to live. Now we get to meet woman wisdom. It says, wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you. 
Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by, by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Now, woman wisdom here is introduced. As I said in the introduction, there's, there's a lot of debate about the particulars of who is represented here. Who is woman wisdom? And I gave you my opinion that woman wisdom personifies or represents God's wisdom as it includes aspects that have been purposed for human perception and discovery. In other words, woman wisdom represents God's wisdom from which a subset has been distinguished a subset that God determined prior to creation would be accessible to mankind. So God in his wisdom has allowed us access to some wisdom. We can't, don't have access to all of God's wisdom. I don't think we could absorb it. But I think woman wisdom is God's wisdom from which God has made some of, of that uh, accessible or co he's communicated some of that to us now you see in verse 20 to 21 she cries out in public places look at this picture of woman wisdom here she is crying out in these public places she cries out trying to get the attention of the crowds that are going by busy going about their lives just living active I got stuff to do I got places to go people to see things to do and here's wisdom crying out to these masses going by, just going about, living, going about their lives. They're crying out for them, wanting their attention. And it seems that many have no interest in listening to her. She's there. She's calling. But we just keep plugging along, ignoring her call. Verse 22 to 25, she denounces those who spurn her appeal. She denounces them. She has, she's called to them. She's stretched out her hands. She's pleaded with them. But to no avail, she longs to bless them through her teaching. Woman wisdom wants to bless them. She wants to give them wisdom in living life so that they will live a blessed life. But they don't want to hear it. They don't put up with it. She longs to bless them, but, but the people generally... Those she classifies as simpletons or the simple or mockers or scoffers and fools, what do they do? They choose to ignore her. So here she is, ready, willing, wanting, calling out, beseeching. And the people are just saying, I got, I'm too busy, I got other stuff going on. I have other things to do. Now because of their rejection of her, she says in 26 through 31 that she's going to laugh at the disaster they reap as a result of rejecting her. So here she is, trying, trying, calling out, yelling, pleading. They're saying, buzz off, don't care. Ah. You know, they're treating her like she's somebody who comes up to you on the street corner wanting money or something. You know, or somebody wants you to sign a petition. I mean, it's like, eh, get away from me. You know, it's like one of these things. And so she says, I called out for you, wanting to bless you. You spurned my appeal. So when you reap the results of your own choice, the results of your conduct, the disaster into which you fall because you rejected me, that she's just going to laugh. You see, it's going to be too late then. If you choose to spurn her appeal and to reject her, and then you find yourself where you chose to be right by rejecting her. He says at that point, you see, she's just going to laugh. Now, whereas the, the unwise, the simple, and the foolish, they suffer disaster in verse 32, those who heed woman wisdom, they will dwell secure and be at ease, right? He said, whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. 
This is the way to live. Look at people's lives. Look at people's lives around, right? You look at them sometimes, you go, how in the world do you make those choices and those decisions that you wind up in this kind of position? One thing after another. Well, they treated woman wisdom as a fool. They were foolish toward her. I don't care. I don't have to learn anything from her. What do I care about divine wisdom? I don't even believe in God. I can tell. From what's happening in your life. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth, and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of the good, and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Now here we have the benefits of the way of wisdom the son is urged in verses 1 and 2 the son is urged to pursue wisdom actively see to pursue wisdom actively i put it as not to be lazy not to think i don't want to engage i don't want to spend time actually pursuing wisdom i got other stuff to do i got the internet you know I don't want to do this. But you see here, he's being uh, urged to pursue wisdom actively. He's urged to receive his father's word. Active. To treasure up his commandments. To make his ear attentive to wisdom. And to incline his heart. to under All of these are verbs. They're things he is to do. He is to act this way and to pursue this actively and this active role it's amplified in verses three and four the son is to call out for insight and is to raise his voice for understanding he's to seek wisdom like it was silver and search for it like it's hidden treasure well that's something right you watch it prospectors watch those people digging around for rocks and things they're after that stuff well, okay, saying pursue wisdom like that. Pursue it as though it's something very valuable. If he does that, one who does that, then he'll understand the fear of the Lord and will find the knowledge of God and will understand righteousness, justice, and equity, every good path in verse 5 and verse 9. You see, what I think the point is is that, is that through the diligent pursuit of wisdom, through that active diligent pursuit one will understand the fear of the lord and find the knowledge of god see which experiences involve or are related to a growing understanding of the way of god the way god calls us to live to seeing more clearly what a life lived in righteousness justice and equity 
what that really involves. See, to gain insight into God's ethical course. To gain insight into how God would have us live and be. To gain a new moral perspective is to gain insight into God. You see, to gain, to gain insight into God's ethical desires, to get this new moral perspective, that is to gain insight into God. It's to advance one's knowledge of God and to comprehend more deeply how fear of the Lord is to be translated into living with others. That's what I think is going on here when he, when he talks about that. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. What do you mean understand the fear of the Lord? You will understand what the fear of the Lord means when it's translated into living with others. This insight into God's ethical desires and how you're to be will translate into that. Verses 6 through 8, they elaborate on the result of seeking that's stated in verse 5. See, those who pursue wisdom diligently, they will gain new insight into fearing God and they will grow in knowledge of him because the Lord is the giver of wisdom you see that this will happen because the Lord is the giver of wisdom he bestows wisdom on those who truly seek him that's the upright he bestows wisdom on those who truly seek him and thus guards their way through it that's what he's talking about there in verse 9 he says then you will understand righteousness and justice, and equity, every good path. And then verse 10 elaborates on the result of seeking. That's stated in verse 9. The reason that diligently pursuing wisdom will result in greater insight into God's ethical course is that it opens the door to God's gift of wisdom. So this is, this is you pursue, you work, you labor and God gives. God gives. You want to sit here and say, no, I got a better idea. I think I will sit in the supermarket over here and just sit there and insist that the beans shoot into my mouth. I'm not going to do anything for it. Well, God says, that's not how this works. You pursue, I will give. But I think that's, that's an important thing for us to grasp, for us to understand that principle and that point. Now, verses 11 to 15, they describe further fruit of the wisdom and knowledge that are given by God in response to this diligent pursuit. One is guarded from evil ways and those who would entice one in that direction. That's important. That's valuable. As you pursue diligently and God provides wisdom, what happens? Well, one is guarded from evil ways and is guarded from those who would entice one in that direction. This is important. Verses 16 to 19 speak of a particularly dangerous threat from which wisdom can deliver the son. And this is the threat of the strange woman, literally. Called a strange woman, and she's also described as a foreign woman. Okay, strange and foreign is literally translated in the American Standard Version. But you say, well, what's that about, strange and foreign? See, it's strange and foreign in the sense that she's willing to flout moral, legal, and customary restraints, and or in the sense she's one with whom one has no right to a sexual relationship. So she's strange or foreign in those ways. That's why most modern translations, they translate these terms quite loosely. Because strange and foreign, when you just put them down there to us, though they carry those implications of one who flouts moral, legal, and customary restraints, or one to whom one has no right of a sexual relationship, we don't pick that up in English just from strange and foreign. So that's why you have most modern translations, they translate these words rather loosely to capture that the, the, her immorality and her forbidden nature. She's variously called an immoral woman and seductress. In the New King James, a loose woman. 
and an adulteress in the New Revised Standard, an adulteress and wayward woman in the NIV, and a forbidden woman and adulteress here in the ESV. But that's accurate. That's, that's I think, right, and that's helpful. But I just wanted to point out to you what it, what it says literally. Now, her lack of restraints described in verse 17, it says she forsakes the intimate relationship, or the ESV says the companion of her youth and forgets her covenant with God. So here's a danger for the son, a particular danger he's being warned off, and this isn't going to be the only time. And there is a reason that young men are warned repeatedly about dangers connected to sex. We think that we're we're the only people to ever know about sex. We're the only people to know about its power and its drive and its potential for misuse. No, no, nobody nobody else ever knew that. You see, so here you see this, and it will, it will come up, it'll come up repeatedly. You see, she winds up, she's a dangerous person. Her lack of restraint, you see that's described there. She forgets her covenant. She commits adultery, thereby violating her marriage vows and breaking her covenant with God. Now, a primary tool of her seduction, it says here, smooth words, meaning flattering speech. And see, this is, this is a way to take down dudes. You see? This is, this is a way you pump up a guy's ego, and it's just a tool. And they are being warned to stay away from this. It's like, you know, warning Will Robinson. For those of you who go back that far. That was a robot. <laughs> you see, so I, he winds up telling him this. She's very enticing, but she's also very deadly, and that's the point of verses 18 and 19. In verse 20, verses 20 to 22, they conclude the unit. Acquiring wisdom will keep the son on the right path, will keep the woman on the right path, the daughter on the right path, will keep us all on the right path, the path that's traveled by good and righteous people. This is what we want in life, and it's not because... It's going to be bad for us. It's going to be great for us. Can you imagine the world if more people had heeded this? You see, it keep the sun on that path. The ultimate consequences of the two paths, you see, they differ radically. Those who walk the right road, those who walk the path that is charted out by wisdom, they will remain in the land, whereas those who reject that way, they're going to be removed. Now, Tremper Longman comments, he summarizes chapter 2, he says, the father has presented a strong argument and an impassioned plea for his son to accept the wisdom that begins with the fear of Yahweh. Only in this way will he escape life's threats and move toward life and away from death. And see, this this is the advice. This is what we need to heed And this is what he's telling us. And he'll have much more to say and emphasize some of these things all here. And then we get to chapter 10 and we'll start looking at some of the classical Proverbs. But there's tons in these instructional discourses in the first nine chapters uh, that will bless our lives. Thanks for coming. I heard that bell.